Welcome back to uh, another episode of Poets in Montana. Uh, I'm Mark Gibbons, and today uh, the guest in the studio is Henrietta Goodman. And uh, before we get into talking and picking up on all things in Henrietta's life, why don't you read us a poem, Henrietta? Okay, uh, this poem is called Natural Disaster. It, it's about um, not really being able to sing and really, really, really wanting to sing, <laughs> um, which is probably, a lot of poets probably have that situation. So. Natural Disaster. <laughs> Like being at the doctor, knee tapped with a little hammer, when Phil told me to sing, my mouth wouldn't open. Just imitate this, he said, then slid his voice in a long ooh like a ghost child on a sliding board. I said, but this is a guitar lesson. And he said, but you said you only wanted to play so you could sing. He said, I can tell you have some sort of trauma around this. I said, I don't know about trauma, Phil, but I'm no Susan Boyle, nor was meant to be. Give me something besides Tom Dooley and maybe. 28 minutes in, I said fine. Let my voice slip southern on cry and die, each long vowel glideless as the high plains, but not, I think, flat. The voice is an instrument, we say, but instrument of what? A means to an end, like a knife. Then isn't the whole body an instrument? We are, we say, moved when something cold and uncontrollable rises up the spine and out the scalp. Another term for frisson is skin orgasm, but you can't do it to yourself or reliably to someone else. Hedonic tone isn't music, it's valence. So the shivers you feel while a kid in the middle school talent show hits each perfect note, positive valence. You could block it with Narcan, but who would? Susan Boyle singing wild horses, her body a paddock where they pace, caught but unbroken, her mouth a gate trampled down. Goosebumps? Maybe it's aesthetic chills, maybe Parkinson's, like Babe who lived with Dot across the street, immobile in a giant chair, hair combed back in a bluish-white frozen wave. Babe, the blue ox, I thought, trembling mountain, natural disaster. That's the body. But the self? He must have been in there while Dot cut watermelon into wedges, salted them, laid them on a plastic tablecloth. All right. And, uh, you, you know, as these are new poems. These are new poems. And uh, so as we get into uh, hearing some more of these new poems, maybe, uh, you know, just to, I mean, a, a whole bunch of people are going to know, obviously, who you are, but some aren't. So, uh, and, you, and that comment, uh, one of the things I like about your work, I guess, is that it, uh, it, it's very... Uh, it's you. It's definitely you. And so I, I, I take it that a lot of the stuff that comes through in these poems are, are from, you know, your own background. Why wouldn't they be? The, the reference to the southern accent uh, in, coming through in your voice. You grew up in North Carolina. I did. Right? I did. Um, and then I left when I was 20. Mm -hmm. And um, I've been here 30 years and the accent is still here. With so me. so, yeah. so you, when you left there, you came here? I did. Okay, and and is it to go to graduate school or mm -hmm. yep cool. to do the MFA here at UM. All right, because I knew two or three other people. I think were maybe there at the same time as you. Probably was uh, was Kevin there when you were there? Kevin? Kevin was an undergrad, but that was when the undergrads and the and the grad students mixed um, quite a lot. So okay. he might as well have been an yeah. MFA. Yeah. Well, very cool. And Earl Craig was there too as and an Earl, undergrad at the same time. Yeah. At yep. the same time. I just talked to Earl on a Zoom not too long ago, so that was kind of cool. Did he do this? Poetry TV? Yes, yes, Yay. yes, but not here. Uh, we did the Zoom thing. And uh, so, um, any, uh, anything you want to say about these poems, that you're, these new poems, before you give us a couple more uh, in advance? Or? Well, I, um, I wrote this book was my most recent book. These are all from a new manuscript. This was um, a sequence of Italian sonnets. Right. So, and I was never, I never thought of myself as a formalist in any way. Um, so writing 48 Italian sonnets was super weird. Um, and I just couldn't stop. And it turns out that when you write all of those sonnets, you really do get into the mode of thinking in iambic meter and thinking in rhyme and thinking about that shape that is very short. Um, and so 
I'm happy with these newer poems because I finally broke away from that <laughs> sonnet thing. And these poems are extremely long in some cases. They just uh -huh. go on and on and on and on. They're very much back to um, free verse, which always felt like it came more naturally. So, right, right. Yeah. But I, I also I noticed that, uh, you know, I, I, in your books, uh, your two previous books, which the book you just mentioned, All That Held Us, uh, it was is the new book, and then in these previous two books, take what you want, which was your first book, mm -hmm. right? And then Hung Hungry Moon. Uh, th th those those poems kind of have a. I mean, you seem to kind of your sense of form kind of takes shape in in the creation of the book too, right? I mean, there's like couplet poems, and then there's there's poems that are just block free verse, and then there's kind of Two parag. I mean, I noticed that you have kind of patterns that uh, that you follow. I mean, I think we we're all kind of obsessive in ways that way. But uh, so your free verse is even sometimes uh, seems like it's got some form to it. Also, do you think? I think so. I mean, if you now that you say that, I definitely think that with my middle book, I was thinking about form more and experimenting mm -hmm. with different poems. Mm -hmm. um, I had a couple of puzzles in there. Um, mm -hmm. I had, you know, poems that were, um, I don't know, a couple of prose poems, mm -hmm. just different things. But I had never really immersed myself in one form. Um, right. Until the m most recent book, and I think that the poems I'm writing now are the least um, formal in, um, and not that I'm not paying attention to other aspects of form like sound and right. line length right. um, and repetition and, and that kind of thing, but they're just sprawling out down the page. Right. Um, they're not broken into stanzas even. They're right. just very, they're, very they're, long. They're, they're, they're a release from that sonnet yes. activity. Yeah, exactly, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> well, give us another one. Okay, let's see. Um, Okay. Well, this is the title poem um, from my new manuscript that I'm hoping will become a book sometime soon. Um, it's it's called Antilia, which will make sense um, in the context of the poem, I think. So, Antilia. Sick with the kind of fever that makes you grateful for everything, I asked for the Moonlight, moonlight Sonata and he put it on and I lay on the couch and drank orange pineapple mango juice, which was the best juice ever, even though it was just dull and not organic and from a plastic lined cardboard carton probably leaking phthalates. I couldn't taste them. I lay there with tears dripping into my ears saying, it's so beautiful, while he made coffee and toast with honey. It's easy to fall in love with heat when you have a fever and believe you're freezing. The same with hypothermia, when you're so cold you start to burn and strew your clothes over the snow as though death is a bedroom you're swept into by a passion so strong you don't care what thread and buttons you scatter behind. Why is even temperature so unreliable? And why was that bird in his yard a lesser goldfinch when it was perfectly yellow and lovely? And why are the Antilles lesser? Aren't they really less than lesser since Antilia didn't, doesn't exist and never did, like the fortunate islands, the isles of the blessed? Antilia means island of the other or opposite island or the inaccessible, meaning, of course, you, or hell is other people, or, as it was meant, hell is the otherness of people, meaning not the individual you. Don't worry, I'm not writing about you. You don't exist except as a phantom island. Sorry. If I were a bird, I might be the lesser Henrietta, but at least not the least. Though if you judged my worth based on how little you had to work to have me, you might understandably call me so. To be just given something of value, like the car my ex-husband's parents gave him after he drove his off a cliff. The idea that someone might give me a car I didn't have to work for all year in a greasy fried chicken place, if I had known all along that it was so easy. I felt duped. It's different kinds of work to obtain, to sustain, to validate, like parking, to keep my bad opinions to myself. It was knapweed honey that morning from a noxious weed whose roots displace the native nectar-producing blooms, diminishing the realm of the bees, while the bees make the sweetest, clearest honey. Get on it and ride. Yeah, that's a, that's a, that's a ride. 
you know, and it, it does a lot of different things, but the sound obviously leads from one thing to another and just the way the mind works. I, and I noticed, you know, because I just kind of went back and reread stuff again before this, and I, I thought, you know, uh, a, lot of your, a lot of your work just has to do with, with, with that, which is the work of poetry, I guess, but the human relationship. You know, the relationships with people, your kids, your family, men, and, uh, and, and this, uh, this is an interesting voice. This is, a, this is different than the last, than the sonnet book, of course, because they're so structured and they have to hit their marks and do that thing, you know. But in all of it, I, I find that in your work, it's very, very revealing. I suppose. I, I mean, you know, yeah. and, and, and I mean, even even yep. though it's a fiction too. I mean, Jennifer Finley and I kind of had this conversation too, and she was talking about how she felt like she's basically really a shy person, <laughs> but she reveals things in in poems mm -hmm. that she would never tell people out loud, you know, or or in conversation, those kinds of things. And I think that's true of a lot of us, probably. Yeah, I mean. One of the things I'm trying to do in these new poems very consciously is to weave together a lot of internal things with a lot of external things mm -hmm. and to see how many different threads I can weave and still have it be at least somewhat under control. I mean, it, to some extent you can juxtapose any two things in a poem and the reader assumes there's a rationale even if the only rationale is just that you're a poet and you've put the two things in the poem, right? right. But, um, but I love to play with you know, following threads of research and looking outward and then also looking inward and trying to sort of interweave mm -hmm. both. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. and, and yeah, it's true. I mean, these, um, my poems have always been very personal and, and probably always will be, sometimes perhaps. Um, in, in a too much information kind of way. Oh, um, oh I don't know. You yeah. haven't heard the other new ones. <laughs> well, I mean, let's, 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 let's. You're going to be like, shut up, Henrietta. No, I, I, I doubt that. So why don't we have another one? I mean, since we're on okay. this path of okay. this, hmm. this new journey. Okay, let's see. Oh, um, I mean, I've already said skin orgasm on TV, so I don't know how much weirder we could get. Um, <laughs> well. that's, that's a real term. It's a real term. Um, Oh, this one. This one, this one was in Poetry Northwest um, last year, and it's super weird. I was really pleased that they took it because yeah. I, I just thought, oh my God, here we go. Okay, um, this one is called Mr. No More Cowboy Hat. When's the last time anyone called you magnificent? Try never. On the edge of absurd, those M words. If he had called your voice mellifluous, you would have laughed. But how not to be charmed by a man wearing a cowboy hat in a swimming pool at night who slides his hand up your leg from ankle to thigh and calls you magnificent. But was that the last night ever with that hat? Now it's glasses and hoodies. Now it's compliments just state the obvious. And what happens when there's some practical problem? You're out of firewood and it's 20 degrees and Mr. No More Cowboy Hat has a date with deep depression or Sunday football. So you split and load by yourself fingers numb in splinter-covered gloves, tears pricking your eyes like the prick of a needle in a fairy tale that means something's going to change or freeze forever. You wish he would cry, that you could dig up his tears from however deeply they're buried and juice them like carrots. Is it empathy or fury that makes you imagine pushing them one by one into some kind of emotion juicer that is, you have to admit, something like a vagina, though you've never been that naive? Still, you imagine feeding them into a machine that both is and is not your body, petrified tears like the tusks of a woolly mammoth, like the whole mammoth excavated from eons of ice. Where in the body would you find them, stuck like kidney stones or salivary stones, and how to harvest them, those little daggers, a shiv or a shank hidden in a boot or belt or sock? When he said he's never lonely, you felt like you do when a student turns in a clearly plagiarized paper. If it's possible to plagiarize the absence of loneliness, which it is, though not convincingly, or why all those hours on Facebook, all those selfies in the hat before he stopped wearing it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh, the emotional juicer. <laughs> That's a great line. <laughs> Uh, that was okay. fun. Okay, well, I'm embarrassed now. <laughs> oh, I, I, no, I think that was, that was a fun poem. Yeah, that was a good one. I had fun. Yeah. <laughs>
Yeah. I, well, I'm, I'm, we wouldn't want to reveal anything <laughs> about the reality behind anything, but uh, but uh, we're on a roll. So, <laughs> so why don't you hit us with another one? Oh, God. Okay. You know, well, I feel like I should, I mean, read something a little more wholesome. Um, I, don't we need to alternate between... Sure, um, sure. Or, or, or would you prefer a, no, another? No, no, um, no. You, you, you're in charge of, of um, the delivery on this. So give us a what, whatever you think we need a break. I, I, for well, that. I think we need a little break <laughs> after after that. Um, this poem, um, at this point, was in New Ohio Review a couple of years ago, and um, it's about. Uh, so I, being from North Carolina, learned to ski very, very late in my life. By late, I mean like a couple of years ago. <laughs> Um, downhill ski, at least. Um, right. And I'm terrible. I love it. It's very meditative, but yeah. I am not good. Um, and so this, I was, you, you know Snowball, right? You must know yeah, Snowball. Yeah, yeah, the, yeah. The, so par, uh, Paradise? Well, I mean, I, I don't know it for, as a skier because I'm not a downhill skier. Oh, you don't ski? I feel no. better now. Um, I thought everybody here skied and it was well, just you know, me I mean, being... Yeah, you know, a long time ago, it... it seemed like it was a spendy thing to do. And right, I, that's I, I, why I, mean, I never did it. Exactly, I was just too broke. Yeah. I mean, I'd rather buy beer, so. <laughs> you know, it was like I had a choice of what I could spend my money on, and I decided not to do that. There was other things to do, I'd get exercise, but. Yeah, yeah, yeah no, that's, I mean, that that was that was my reason. I mean, in North Carolina, there's not really any place but to But I have been but. up there to just walk around and, and some of that, but it, but Paradise is a, is a run. Paradise is a run Steep. up there, and well, yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a blue, you yeah. know. It's a it's it's a medium ish, but for me, it's it's a really long run, and it's yeah. deceptive at first because you go along and it's kind of easy, and you're like, oh, this is lovely, and then there's this one spot where you're like, oh shit, this is <laughs> I'm gonna die. <laughs> yeah. um, so I spent some time standing at the top of that, and that's where this point came from. Um, <laughs> so it's called the Minute Snowball teaching their daughters to ski. The first one is half a couple, young, their daughter four or five in pink snow pants and a pink flowered coat. They're stopped at the top of the last long run, skis wedged sideways. She's made it this far and now she's wailing, I can't do it, I can't do it, I don't want to. Almost everyone pauses before this sheer slope gleaming in the late afternoon sun, this almost vertical descent that someone named Paradise. She's sobbing, I can't do it, and her father says, what do you need? Do you need some fish? Do you need some tea swift? He reaches for his phone and shake it off starts playing, and he barks like a seal and flaps his arms and stomps his skis a little like flippers, and she holds out her gloved hand, and he puts goldfish crackers in it, tosses a few, and catches them in his mouth, and they start down paradise, her skis in a careful pizza, her father telling her when to turn. The next one is older, bearded, his daughter older too, high school or college, hard to tell through helmet and goggles. She's silent as he coaches, drop your shoulder, now shift your hips, now turn, drop your shoulder. I'm trying to translate his advice into something my own body could do, toes curled in my boots, skis crossed at the tips, poles flailing behind me and sticking in snow as I skid toward the trees. She's making long, slow turns. He's patient, saying over and over, good girl, in a way that means she's as frightened as I am and her goodness is his world and is, to him, absolute. She doesn't look at him. She's watching her skis as they glide back and forth through paradise, watching herself not falling. Cool. So you were... Uh you were there wishing you had someone like that to help you down that slope before you took yeah, off. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. And, and, and just loving the, the interactions between these men and, and their yeah. daughters um, yeah. and teaching them. Yeah. Um, I thought that was beautiful. And I was envious, um, yeah. but not in a, in a you know, ill-tempered way. I was envious and also just so it's, it's love. pleased. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Watching that go on. Pretty cool. Yeah, it was beautiful. Yeah, parents and kids. Well, uh, is there any, do you want to go backwards at all? Do you want to give us something? Do you want, why don't you give us, just for kicks, you want to read, read something in here? Okay. I mean, just to, yeah. Yeah, because, because we talked about it as these are all sonnets. I remember uh, 
having the conversation with uh, Greg Keeler did a book also of just all songs. Yeah, and it's so good. I, uh, yeah, and, and, and he said that I said, because he was doing it for like years, and he said, I would write, I just didn't know what else I had to say. So I thought, well, maybe I'll just do a form and see what happens. And so, so he said he wrote like a sonnet a day for years. That's great. Every single day, you yeah, know. And, that's awesome. and so because I asked him because he had like what, about 200 or something in this book, and I said, so uh, you know, uh, were these, you know, did, did it all happen like a year or two? He said, oh no, no. He said I had I I culled these down from about you know. <laughs> 800 or some ridiculous wow. thing. We just <laughs> it dove into the world of, yeah, sonnet wow. exploration. So That's intense. I know. That's what I thought. But this is intense, too. It, it, and and it's, a, it's a journey, this is. Yeah, well, it's a, it's a, it was a weird project because it's a memoir. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And it's also a whole bunch of it. I picked, like, the two, at the time, at least, that I was working on, the two least fashionable poetry things I could possibly uh, choose, which were, you know, very, very personal work, um, mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. also um, sonnets, which, I don't know, I, f I felt that maybe those two things, particularly those mm -hmm. two things together, were out of fashion. Um, and that's only been a few years ago, but less so now. Um, mm -hmm. I think, um, you know, there are always those shifts back and forth, and certainly personal material has never been completely in fashion or completely out of fashion. Right, and, so, and sonnets have kind of come maybe back yeah. into fashion a little bit, but of course they were out of fashion for quite a while. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But, uh, and this is a Sicardi Prize, is that? Yeah, it was the, it was the John Shardy Prize from uh, Bookmark Press, and which I was very happy about. Yeah. Um, because I was sending this around for a while thinking, oh my God, it's too weird. And also the poems are not individually titled right. because they're intertwined. So they will be, it's, it's not a, a crown of sonnets because that's, uh, yeah, wasn't going to do that. But, um, but there's a little uh, piece of a line or sometimes even a right. whole line right. that starts the next one following from the one before. Right. Um, so I didn't title them individually, which also kind of made it weird for sending them out individually and, and reading them and finding them. Like, right. like what page is that poem on? You know, that kind of thing. So, right. um, yeah. But, but it is, I mean, because it's a memoir, there's a lot that um, contemplates childhood and adolescence and then adulthood. Um, the, whole, the, the premise of the book is I grew up in North Carolina in this house um, with my mother and her sister and their mother. Mm -hmm. So this household of women. And there were really no men um, that I encountered at all, ever. Right. Um, right. And are, you, are you an only child? I'm an child? only child, okay. yep. Yeah. So, and 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 it was odd. I mean, there was a um, there was a lot of, of weirdness in that environment um, that has sort of taken me a lifetime to process. Um, and so, this book was um, sort of a part of that process of of thinking back on. Okay, well, how did this kind of unconventional childhood that I had um, have an impact on? you know, who I turned out to be and how I interact with other people um, in my adult life. Right. So, yeah. Yeah. So, it's, it's wonderful. I, 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 uh, and it is very, very connected. Like, the, like you said, that pulling those lines from the previous sonnet and, and weaving it into the next one. And, and just reading them in succession, it seems like it reads like a, like a memoir in a way because it's nice to read it all in, in, in a row instead of just trying to, you know, open it up and pull one out and then go to another spot. Yeah. It, you can do that, but I mean, it it, uh, it does definitely read like a memoir. Yeah, that, that's what I was hoping. Um, and and it's, it's a super short book. I mean, each, you know, each sonnet is so short. Do you ever do that where you, you just, because to me the hardest part of starting anything is starting the thing. I mean, that, that right? I mean, just getting started. Um, once you're started, no matter what it is, you're in it. And then mm -hmm. it's just easier because you're already in it. And so for poems, I mean, I think initially that was part of why I did the, you know, little bit of, of you know, the previous poem in the next poem was just mm -hmm. to keep it going. Mm -hmm. Do you ever, do you mm -hmm. ever do that? No, not really. I mean, I, I uh, but I'm not a, uh, I, I'm not kind of a project ordered mind. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. It's like, uh, uh, like, like the idea of maybe maybe just doing a bunch of sonnets, maybe making a book of sonnets, or 
or doing, uh, having kind of a topical sort of approach to something. I, I'm just not, I, I just kind of operate, you know, in a daily kind of fashion. Yeah. And then I pull together and then I sit down and kind of arrange things the way I want them to go and hopefully they work kind of from one to the other or maybe play off of. And there are links back with, with you know, oftentimes it's just words or phrases, mm -hmm. maybe not whole lines, but uh, yeah, yeah. Kind of that way when it comes time to organize a book. Yeah. But but not with an intention going forward. I, I'm not usually doing that. But yeah, I don't. I guess I haven't with other projects. But this one, and and I also just I would write one and think that then I wanted to sort of turn it around and look at it a different way. Or mm -hmm. um, there's that assignment that I don't know. Um, I can't remember whose assignment it is. Um, it's in that book called The Practice of Poetry, mm -hmm. edited by Chase Twistle, Twitchell and somebody else. Mm -hmm. It's purple. Anyway, mm -hmm. it's a bunch of poetry exercises. And mm -hmm. one of the exercises is take a claim that you've made in a poem and start a poem by asserting the exact opposite. And oh, okay. I love that exercise. And I've done it, um, I mean, I, I had that kind of in mind with this, but I've done it just in other you know, probably four or five times throughout my writing where I'll just want to sort of poke at something that I've said was true right, um, right. and insist that, okay, I have to get myself into the mindset of, of insisting that the opposite is true. And, you know, I mean, sometimes the opposite is true. Oh, yeah, totally. Um, and within so, us. Yeah. I mean, we're, we're just, I mean, that's a great idea because we are just full of contradictions. Mm -hmm. you know? Yeah, <laughs> from yeah. day to day, from hour to hour, sometimes. <laughs> totally, totally, and I and I love that um, the sort of that contradictoriness. And now I want to go do that exercise. <laughs> it's finally summer, and I actually have time to write. So like, yeah, oh, right. Oh, which is another thing we should touch upon maybe before you launch into to, to reading something out of there is that you are now teaching in Billings. I am at uh, University of Montana or no uh, oh, at uh, Rocky Mountain College. Oh, Rocky Mountain College. Yep. Okay. Yes. Yes. Yep. And that's going well? It's going very well. You're, it's um, You're loving it? It's well, yeah, I am loving it. Um, yeah. the only the only thing about it that I don't love is that I'm trying to maintain my home here in Missoula and a home there. Right. Um, so right. there's a lot of back and forth. Right. Um, right. Are your boys around here? Um, my younger son has been living in my house Got without it. me. He's 17. He'll be 18 next week. Um, so he has had the house to himself in Missoula for the past year except on the weekends when I'm home. His dad lives like five blocks Good away. Dream so come he's true. Right? He has he is amazing. He has been so good. He takes care of the pets. He's got like three cats and a dog to take care of. He like cooks and grocery shops and cleans the house. He's incredible. Um and he's grown up so much yeah. um from doing that. But yeah, then I come home on the weekends and he's like, Oh <laughs> So yeah. But yeah, but no, the um Rocky Mountain College is great and um and it's nice to have, I was, for years, I was patching together adjuncting positions right. and um, right. non-tenure track positions. So to have right. something that's a real job um, is yeah. very nice. Right, a steady yep. income. Yep, for sure. Very yep. cool. Well, good. Yeah. So okay. give us some sonnet Let's see. activity. Now, well, now, like I said, it's hard to find. There's one, um, there's the one in the last section which is, um, this is what happens when you don't um, title your poems. Here we go. <laughs> um, it's in here somewhere. And it's also been a while since, here we go, it's this one. Um, so this is from the last section, and this is one of the, the ones that is looking at sort of adult life through the lens of, you know, um, growing up without any sort of relationship models mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. and so I, th I think it's it's fairly self-explanatory it's got a quote from Paradise Lost in it um, which um, when I read this I read this in Lubbock where I did my PhD I went back down and um, I was at Texas Tech on campus doing a reading and um, and I this quote from Paradise Lost came into the poem and I think people were alarmed um, it, it, It'll you'll see um, <laughs> But I, I, I found it hilarious So it's, it's this you know the thing about this book is that this book has no sense of humor I mean mm -hmm. I have a sense of humor I think and these yeah. new poems yeah, have well, a sense of humor yeah. um, And I, I hope right but humor is not at 
the the forefront of this book in any way. It's this is a very serious book, mm -hmm. and so the poem that I'll read is probably the only one that has a humorous moment. Um, we'll see if you think so. Yeah. <laughs> um, so it's it's not titled. So I'll just jump right in. He showed me what he was, an altar boy, a drunk, a tragic hero, fingers stained from nicotine, his posture force restrained, potential not kinetic. He'd destroy, then resurrect himself, transformed by joy, a passing radiance in darkness. Trained to find the fatal flaw, I read his feigned achievements, paralytic fear, alloy of character and man. Which way I fly is hell, myself am hell, Satan, my 12th grade English crush, and so I analyzed the text and not the reader, not the why of my pursuit of ruined beauty, wealth of loss, not what in me he recognized. So, yeah. Gotta have, right? You read Paradise Lost. Who, who reads Paradise Lost and doesn't have a crush on Satan? Right? <laughs> he's the hero. He's, he's, he's the sexiest <laughs> character in there. He's, I mean, uh, you know, I don't know. Um, yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, else, uh, anything you want to say uh, off the top of your head or before you read us another poem? Gosh. Or? Well, I was thinking, um, because I brought the books, but then I brought this big stack of new poems, but I mm -hmm. do have one, speaking of like poems in a series mm -hmm. and that kind of thing, in my first book there were these five or six poems, I think there were six total, that were written from the point of view of Gretel, the fairy tale character oh, Gretel yeah. in Hansel and Gretel, but right. my Gretel, um, her Hansel was not her brother, but her lover. Um, and it, at least I didn't intend it as both, um, otherwise that would be alarming. Um, but, um, but I was definitely playing upon the, um, the sort of plot of that fairy tale with the idea of being cast out and the witch um, and all of that. And my Gretel, um, in these poems was also not really sure whether she was um, Gretel or the witch or both, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. which was something that I was trying to play with. So coming back around to the idea of poems in a sequence, so the Gretel poems were at least partly grounded um, at the Boyden Wilderness Writing Residency, which I did um, a couple of years before this book came out. Mm -hmm. So, um, and I'll explain what that is. Um, but. Three years ago, I guess it was three years ago, um, I got to go back to the Boyden residency just for three weeks, not for a mm -hmm. whole summer, and I wrote another Gretel poem. So mm -hmm. I thought I would read maybe one of the original mm -hmm. ones and then one of the yeah, much yeah, more that recent one. Great. That great. So the Boyden residency is, um, I guess, you, you don't really have to know what it is to, to understand the poems, but I'll kind of explain. It's, it's a really amazing as the, the name suggests, Wilderness Writing Residency mm -hmm. in Southwestern Oregon on the Rogue River. Um, and okay. one very, very, very lucky writer um, gets to go each year um, with or without um, a partner or family or whatever. Um, mm -hmm. You can go totally alone or you can take your family with you. Um, and it's, uh, you know, five months um, oh, wow. at least. Five um, months. Yeah, Kacha Kuypers did it. Yeah. Corey Williamson, whom we were talking yeah. about earlier, yeah. did it. So there's wow. this whole, there's this um, group of, of cool. Montana people who have, have gotten um, to right. do that. Yeah. Um, and it's, it's amazing, but it is extremely remote. So there's um, there's no electricity. There there is running water um, that's piped down from a spring. There's mm -hmm. solar panels. Mm -hmm. There's propane appliances. Mm -hmm. But at least when I did it the first time, there was no phone. If you wanted to talk on the phone, you had there was a satellite phone that was extremely expensive, and you could climb a hill and hold it up in the air at the top of the hill. Um, and if the satellites like aligned correctly, you could call out, but nobody could call in. So it was, it was frightening. I was there. My older son was, had just turned three and was there with me for okay. part of that experience. Mm -hmm. It's a two hour drive to town. So super remote. Um, anyway, and I felt like, um, the first time I did it, I was just terrified and ill-equipped, um, mm -hmm. and did it anyway, which was, um, you know, a very good thing. Yeah. But when I got to go back, so three years ago, um, or almost three years ago, the resident um, who was there um, for the summer needed a dog sitter for three weeks. She needed okay. to go and didn't really, um, couldn't really take her dog where she was going. So she asked if any of the former residents wanted to go and dog sit. 
And I jumped on it immediately because I had always felt that I needed to go back and sort of redeem myself or go back and be not terrified and have more right. of a, you know, the kind of experience that it could have been. Um, right. So, I, and of course, when I got back there, I started thinking about, you know, who I had been um, before when I was there, which would have been, I guess it had been about 16 years since mm, I had wow. done it the first time. So mm -hmm. quite a long time. Um, so I was sort of, you know, reconnecting with that version of myself um, and also having a lot more fun. I did a lot more hiking and was just less um, apprehensive the whole time and didn't have a three-year-old with me. So I wasn't worried. Wait, you did know. you have the three-year-old for the whole five months? No, I had, we kind of switched him back and forth. Oh, okay. So I had him for part of the summer, but, um, but I was just terrified, yeah. you know, that if something happened to me, <clears throat> what is a three-year-old yeah, going to do? And I mean, it, so it, it was, it, that, that part was, was really, yeah, um, really totally. kind of horrible. Um, yeah. And so, and that they have a better phone now. Um, you can actually call someone from the cabin and someone can call you. So it alters the experience right, um, right. pretty drastically. So anyway, long preface, but I thought I would read one of the Gretel poems that is set at that residency and then the newer Gretel yeah. poem that goes 16 back. 16 years later. Um, yeah, exactly. Um, so let me see what page it's on in here, 27. So this one's called Gretel Alone. Call these woods a cage and you wouldn't be so far wrong. Sun long gone by late afternoon and town farther. Trees fall for no reason, just their own weight pulling them moaning down. I keep a list of untraceable sound, a giggle of water, a drum, something or someone bawling. Beyond the meadow, nothing but thornbrush and a bad smell. Who taught me these rules? Don't walk in the white fog that fills the valley and rises like a smothering doe. Don't touch the white foam that bubbles from certain plants like the mouth of a rabid dog. Whose whisper says build a necklace from the bleached spine of a bird, the hollow globe of a wasp gall, smooth and weightless but stringed inside. A woman in an alley puts her hand through the dark of a barred window and stands still a long time. A child holds the woman's free hand, red candy plugging her mouth, the tall window empty as a blind eye. I walk the trail to the river with a metal rake, peeling back layers of moss and leaves. I snag vines and tear them free, roll rocks to the edge and push them over. Do I mean to preserve the trail or obscure it as I step backward in a cloud of stinging gnats, erasing my footprints as I go? In a breeze, a rain of needles falls. I am half a story. So, yeah. Um, one of the, there's a trail that goes from the Boyden property down to the Rogue River, um, but they understandably don't just want every random person who's floating or hiking down the river to go up there um, mm -hmm. to their property. So uh, there's a sort of a paradoxical job that you have as a resident. You clear the trail, but you also obscure the trail at towards the bottom. Um, right. So that's what I was doing in that poem and just in thinking right. about that in, in metaphoric ways. So, um, <coughs> excuse me. So then when I went back, it was, um, it was very interesting. Um, so this one's called Gretel Returns. And it's, um, I think it's clear in the poem, but one of the little towns that, um, that you can, there's several different ways that you can get into the property, but one of the ways is to go through this town called Merlin, um, which had always kind of perplexed me. So, Gretel returns. Turns out Merlin is named for the bird, not the wizard. Not the matter of Britain, but the matter of last place to get gas, last place to call the man who broke your heart or anyone else. All along, Esmerion, not Myrden, and no connection between. In the matter of coming back to do it better, Merlin's a little larger now, still mostly fly shops and the Dollar General, mostly heirloom apple trees and one intersection where the road finds the river. After that, Indian Mary, Galice, then Rand and Argo and the Grave Creek Bridge where I turn and go up. Now the cabin has a party line walkie-talkie phone that sometimes works, so you can tell me again how I am tough, even when you aren't sure it's me, a strange number on a Thursday morning and you 20 hours and three states away. Tell me how you know, when you know me so little my voice is a surprise each time. Truly, you don't sound so tough yourself, you sound afraid. 
The things I love best here are the most fragile, not the bears, fewer than there were, not the merlin, bird that steals nests, eats other birds, chases its prey up the sky. When I think of Esmerion, I think of Esme, beloved, though there's no connection. So tell me, when a tree's across the road a half mile from the cabin and it's late and I'm lucky not to be farther out on this shattered road crossed with snails, their wine-dark bodies stretched smooth as the new skin of the madrones. Tell me, when I'm crying too hard to drive because my son is three years gone but not gone the way the gone go, into the shuffle of madrone leaves, the ferns, the hummingbirds, the wasps, the snake with black and white rings, purple asters, tanager blushing like a peach. Tell me, when my tire goes flat on a hill, when the phone is down and the ghost of my dog Charlie is running out at dawn to scare the crows, when the ghost of my son is sitting on the counter kicking his heels. Or better, go back and tell that terrified woman squinting into the sun, child in her arms, wrinkles just starting around her eyes. Tell me now, when I'm blocking the tires with rocks, cranking the jack, balancing the spare on my feet to fit it onto the wheel, when I'm sawing the tree with a handsaw in a cloud of mosquitoes, the woods creaking and snapping and singing around me, when I think of my beloveds, gone and everywhere. <laughs> That one might be kind of sappy. I don't know. Oh, no. I don't think it's sappy. It's just... <laughs> you got to be sappy occasionally, I guess. But. Well, I mean, it, it's, you know, and it's always a, a, a challenge, I guess, to, to hear a, a, a long, chalked, full poem orally yeah. without the assistance of, you know, going through it at, at, uh, visually. I mean, it's just, it's hard to keep up. There's just so much that's in that poem. But you know you, what you tipped us off, sort of in the beginning, to give us a head start as to what you were up to and what was going on. It was a, yeah, it's it's a that's a good poem. Um, so what what uh, what else in this this new book that you that you're that you're working on? You already kind of know what your title poem is, uh, and that that reference. Remind us again of that reference, this island that, uh, the, the definition of, of uh, what was the word again? Antilia. Antilia, it's right. It's like the idea that, you know, the, um, um, these islands that, and that, um, I mean, I could go back to it because I don't, I don't yeah, get it it's, wrong. It's, um, but it's, whoops, there it is. Um, so it's that, so there's like the, um, you know, the, the lesser Antilles and the idea that there are these various sort of, of mythological islands. And that's what in that poem, the fortunate right. islands, the Isles of the Blessed. Um, and then um, the idea of, of being like, you know how like there are birds that are named like lesser and least, mm -hmm, um, like mm -hmm, the lesser mm -hmm, goldfinch. Mm -hmm. And um, and that was just bugging me, and mm -hmm. the and that you know associated with islands also um, these lesser islands. Yeah, um, yeah. So yeah, I the don't lesser. know that just I was just having fun right. with with right. all of that and being the the lesser Henrietta. Um, yeah, I don't yeah, know. Yeah, I don't yeah. know who the greater Henrietta would be. Well, she's tomorrow. But I'm, <laughs> the, I mean, I, I guess on, on yeah, on various days, I'm yeah, the greater exactly. or the lesser. Some days I'm right. the least Henrietta. I guess. Yeah, but yeah. That's I, ho true. I hope not to be. Well, and, and so, so all of these poems kind of bob a little bit in and around that idea in a way, I mean, that, that we all deal with all the time, right? I mean, these are, it's a common sort of a theme, I think, particularly for poets, maybe. I mean, don't you think that we're constantly yeah. dealing with this contradiction stuff yeah. that, that, yeah, that sure. is facing us yeah. in this existence that we don't know what the hell is going on? Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, what else? Is there something from? Uh, no. How about some, how about something from, from from Hungry Moon? Oh, okay. Anything in particular that I was looking at this earlier and what was I? Uh, oh, I know what I was I, I was thinking. Uh, was that uh, w one of the things that struck me, I guess, when I was reading it again was like the references to the hunting references that were going on in the poems. 
the wasn't there uh, like uh, bird hunting? Oh, a lot of the bird oh, hunting. Oh, the or, ones and I was gonna, Canada, the geese. And I and yeah. I, I was wondering if if uh, if that was something that you were associated with personally, or it was something that that someone you were with was. Up to. I stole that poem. I mean, okay. you know, we're okay. like crows, oh, right? Oh, totally. I mean, that's yeah, yeah, it's yeah, like yeah, don't yeah. don't tell us anything. We'll just right. take it. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. But yeah, no, I know what poem you're talking about. It's called Canada, and it. Um, I can read that one if you sure. want me to, because sure. um, I was well, I was pleased with this one when I wrote it. Um, and I don't this book. Um, I don't. I you know I don't go back to it as much mm -hmm. to read. Um, from so I'm happy to read something from it, but yeah, this was a story that uh, my former partner told me about um, hunting geese. Yeah, and yeah. Um, so yeah, I thought it was a, a creepy story. Yeah. So it's just called Canada. When he rose out to collect the geese, they see him floating like an unexpected god, oval hull, weathered gray, oars treading the dark water. They see him coming a boy barely more than retriever of wing-shot bodies. See how he snatches them from the scum of ice and wrings them like he's turning the crank of a machine. So hard sometimes the neck snaps, then winds to a thread, then severs, body flung back into the water, head and black beak dripping in his hand. When he rows out to collect the geese, he thinks, like any god, this is just what you do. They see him coming and dive if they can and swim, stroking in slow motion, water rolling over their wings, and him in the boat, and them knowing he'll catch them, and him knowing they know. I'm, well, I'm glad, I'm glad that happened in a way. I mean, just the whole uh, reference to picking up <coughs> other people's stories, because I mean, that's not something that we do also, because we, like you say, we're thieves, and, and uh, stories or books or whatever. How about clay pigeons? Um, I think Do that you read one, that? that was, yeah, I could, I could read that. You know, I don't know if I ever had read that, but it immediately follows the one that I just read. Oh, and, okay. I, um, I, I knew that there was a close <coughs> connection there. And it's the, it's the same, same character mm -hmm, that I'm talking mm -hmm, about here right. and same kind of theft of a story. Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. so yeah, this, and this, the, the character who's in these poems come back, comes back in a later section that mm -hmm. has a, a whole section of, of focus on, um, on that relationship too. So, um, but yeah, this one's called Clay Pigeons. And this I think is sort of sonnet-ish. I don't mm -hmm. remember. Let mm -hmm. me see. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen. Yeah. This, so this is a free verse sonnet, which right. I, I, I don't like the idea of a free verse sonnet. I'm like, if you write a sonnet, you got to do the work. Like, you got to, <laughs> I mean, iambic meter and rhyme and, and it's, it's all got to be there. But, but there is such a thing as a free verse sonnet because that shape with the turns and the resolution um, or lack of resolution, sure. those are still very sonnet-like qualities. Um, so I, I, it's it's fine, but this I wouldn't call this a real sonnet, but it right. is a it's a it's a sonnet-ish poem. So anyway, <coughs> clay pigeons. Even after a man yells pull and the mesh door of the cage flaps open, they squat immobile, dull gray and sculpted in the, southern, in the suburban mist, their signal to flush more private than this place. Three miles past the skeet range, doctors in filson coats drinking cans of beer and peeling hundreds off a roll. To win, they drop the bird in a circle chalked on the ground. Always here, you're a boy among men, feathers warm through your gloves, each hole a bead of blood. Always the men shooting, talking, the words just widening clouds of breath, and you outside the ring, reserving judgment, waiting for a sign. Cool. So that, so the, uh, the, the speaker in that poem, uh, uh, does the speaker in that poem have a gender in your mind? That's a good question, right? Because I mean, it is. I mean, I, I, because I, you know, because yeah, you're the poet, right. and I assume to begin with, it's kind of like when I, I remember reading a, one of the novels that David Cates wrote, and I'm reading that first chapter, and I'm just like really screwed up here, thinking this is really strange. And then all of a sudden, I realized, no, the the main character, the the narrator, is is a woman. Mm -hmm. And but but the guy writing it is a man, right? So it was just threw me for a loop. But 
Yeah, and this one is, now that I look at it more, it's a little weird because, I mean, there's the, sometimes with poetry when we use you, mm -hmm. we're talking about us and also hoping to sort of, you know, involve the reader. But the you in this poem is more of a sort of external address, mm -hmm. um, although it wouldn't, in, in my mind, but it wouldn't necessarily be read that way at all mm -hmm. if, um, if the reader didn't know the way that, that we use I mean, you. This, because, I mean, there's yeah. this always here, you're a boy among men, you outside the ring, reserving judgment, which could easily be a poem written um, or spoken by a male speaker. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, right. that's interesting, the Mark. The, I one, the one that's, yeah. that's being, you know, that's being in, put in that position yeah. or, or feeling that yeah. uh, in that situation. Yeah, and I, I mean, when I, when I wrote it, I was definitely thinking of the sort of doubling of the idea of this boy sort of being there and observing the adult world and observing this thing with, with the pigeons um, and being sort of, you know, outside and inside um, and trying to right. reserve judgment. And I was trying to sort of, you know, duplicate that sense of reserving judgment. Mm -hmm. But yeah, that's, I've never really, because like I said, I haven't really read this one. Um, Maybe at a reading or two when the book first came out, mm -hmm. um, but this was when did this come out? Two thousand thirteen, I think. I think it was so it's been it's been a while. Um, but yeah, that is super interesting. Um, the the assumptions that we make but, but, about but, but that's what's I mean that's the what's interesting about any art. I watched a program last night on PBS at the end of the evening before I went to bed, and it was about uh, uh, <coughs> uh, what the hell was his name? Tyrus Wong. He was a he was an artist, uh, oh. a Chinese American artist that was born in 1910, and he lived till 2016. He died at 106. Wow! And uh, and he was, uh, you know, he he lived through all of that, you know, Asian discrimination period up until after the war, and uh, and then. But he was successful, and and he was incredible. His, his art was amazing, but uh, but there again, it doesn't matter what you what your art form is, we go to it, and you know, and then we make it ours. Mm -hmm. right? Yeah. I mean, so you know, you don't you, people find things sometimes in poems that you write, and you go, oh, well, that's cool. <laughs> that's your poem, you know. I mean, like, that's that, that's the experience of the person taking it. Mm -hmm. in. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah, cool. Well, what else? Do you want to, <gasps> is there anything you want to read? Any, any more of your new stuff that you want to share? No, I mean, let's see. Um, I have this, let's see if I have any. There's maybe a couple. That one's very long. I don't think that's right. There's a couple that I could read that, um, <clears throat> One, because it's set in Montana and it sort of goes with the, um, the Mr. No More cowboy hat, at least in my mind, except it's even um, darker. Um, less, uh, less, less, less funny, I think, although there are some funny moments. Um, and then I have a poem about mushrooms, which I've been thinking about morels. Do you go hunting morels? No, I mean, I, I, we, oh, I've, yeah, we've gone out looking a couple times, but I'm not a serious morel hunter. But I, I, I know that they're, you know, like up on Lolo Pass and whatnot, a lot of people go up there. And I, jo I joined the, the Montana Foraging uh, Facebook group. Mm -hmm. Oh, my God, those people argue so much. It's, it's, I'm almost, I'm about to drop out of the group. I'm like, I just wanted to know, like, about various edible mushrooms, but they're always having fights. Like, it's, <laughs> I, I look and it's like, oh, my God. They're having so many fights. Like, do you cut them off? Do you cut them off at the base or do you pull them up? And apparently it doesn't matter, but then some people think it does matter, and they go back and forth, and it repeats Just eat the every, goddamn mushroom. every single day. <laughs> so, I've, yeah, but I, um, I have been hoping to go morel hunting, and I haven't gotten out yet. So I guess I could read my mushroom poem. Um, well, this, and this might be about the last one, probably. Oh. I think we're, we're probably getting close to the end of our time together. Okay, then I'll read this one rather than the other one, because this one is, is both strange and, <coughs> I guess, sort of a more positive than the other one. Mm -hmm, so, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and this is actually, so the one that I read, um, the natural disaster one that I think I read first about trying to sing. Right, right. This is, um, this was a little uh, sequence of three. And so this one, which is called The Fruit Body, um, if I read it as a poem by itself, it has that title. But if it's part of the, 
if, if I'm treating the three poems as all one long, long, long poem, mm -hmm. then um, it doesn't have that title. But, um, but the, the three sections don't really have much in common. But so, okay, yeah, I'll read my mushroom no. poem. Okay. Okay. Um, the Fruit Body. Like the life of the mind, much of the life of a mushroom exists in darkness, underground, above only the fruit bodies, surfacing now a horse harnessed to a press, like the hands of a clock, the horse circles. A child feeds stalks of sugarcane to the cast iron rolls. In the cauldron, a greenish juice. On the other side, a growing pile of flattened stalks. Fire boils the syrup to molasses, to which one could add water and yeast, then distill, then age to make rum. Kill devil, or just a, body of, or just a bottle of Bacardi some kid got from his brother on a rainy morning, two days after the hurricane, his mother at work, the house dark. A girl parks, climbs over the white oak fallen across the drive, scallops of fungus on the bark. A fungus is more animal than plant, eukaryotic, each cell's nucleus enclosed in membranes like every one of our cells, a good kernel, like euphemism, good speaking. She's tired of being a virgin, but she barely knows him and she's nervous. When he offers the rum, she asks for a mixer and he stirs up a pitcher of black cherry Kool-Aid, Excuse me, warmish because the power is out, and this magenta drink is the last thing she remembers for ten hours. Yeasts have only two sexes. The split gill mushroom has 28,000, which makes finding a suitable partner difficult. She's never been sure how many partners she had that day. That boy, yes, but what about the hours he drove her around in her car? What about the other boy with him when they left her at Duane's, where she woke slowly, one contact lens gone, Duane offering her a sock monkey in a Santa hat and begging her not to cry? Boys throw up, girls cry, said the nurse who helped her out of wisdom teeth anesthesia the year before. So she's girl and boy. All embryos have a primordial phallus. Mushrooms develop from the primordium. A membrane called the hymenium covers their gills. Sometimes the fruit body is creative work, the making of names, earth star, bird's nest, cannonball. She thinks of those mushrooms still harvesting radiation from Chernobyl, thinks of Duane bringing wet towels, holding her up while she vomited Kool-Aid on his sheets. She's 30 years older now, able to drink a mojito without gagging, able to saute chanterelles and take chanson and sing. That's nice, nice, nice. That's a good one to end on. It's a, what a weaving of, uh, of all those different things that you do in that poem, those, all those different strands. That, I guess, yeah, that's probably an example of, yeah. of what I'm, I don't know if it, they all hold together. Sometimes I'm like, okay, I just went outside of something. Um, <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, but, but that's, yeah, that, it, I, got, I got obsessed with, with mushrooms for a while. Yeah, that's um, a tight in one. In there. Yeah, that's so, a good one. Yeah, it's thanks. It's working. Thanks. Well, and uh, and Antilly is that? Antilly, uh, An Antilia. Antilia. Antilia, Antilia yeah. is the is the name of the book. We'll I, look I hope. For. I hope so. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, uh, that's probably all the time we have for today. Thanks for joining us, and Henrietta Goodman. Thank you for being here. Thanks, Mark. You betcha. See you next time. Yeah, lifetime filled